Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Lord Jesus, you are the living light to transform darkness into light. Through the blessings of this glorious Sunday, make us worthy to praise you with all those who saw the radiant light of your resurrection. We worship and we thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the living one who by his death gave life to his creation. By his resurrection, he saved his church, gave joy to his flock, brought us back to his father, and enriched us with the gifts of his spirit of holiness. To the good one we glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. Holy begotten Son, you were born of the Father before all ages, and by your creative will you separated light from darkness on this, the first day of the week. You fashioned all creation to honor Adam, the image of your majesty. We praise and we thank and we thank you and celebrate proclaiming. Blessed are you, for you appeared in the flesh on earth like us, and you lived among us. Blessed are you, for you were buried and counted among the dead. And you shined your light in the sadness of the tomb. Blessed are you, for you rose to life, giving good hope to all. And you filled the angels with radiance. And they appeared at your tomb like flashes of lightning. Now, O Christ, we ask of you with the fragrance of this incense to make us worthy to rejoice in the glory of your radiant resurrection. Breathe life into our departed and make them worthy to stand at your right hand in your eternal light that you have prepared for those who love you. With them we praise and thank you for your graces, and we glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever.
of our incense and our prayers. I may we become a sweet fragrance through our good works and our actions. Hear our petitions and grant rest to our departed in your dwelling place of joy. O Lord, our God, to you be glory forever. Kandi shant aloho kodi shant hayalato no kodi shant lo yoto with joy from the mountain Sunday is a fee so great offer praise to the Lord God and with angels celebrate first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and the children forever. Brothers and sisters, when I came to you proclaiming the mystery of God, I did not come with sublimity of words or of wisdom for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and much trembling, and my message and my proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with demonst a demonstration of spirit and power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Yet we do speak a wisdom to those who are mature, but not a wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are passing away. Rather, we speak of God's wisdom, mysterious, hidden, which God predetermined before the ages of our glory, and which none of the rulers of this age knew. For if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what the eye has not seen and the ear has not heard and what has not entered the human heart, what God has prepared for those who love him. This God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit scrutinizes everything, even the depths of God. Praise be to God always. Alleluia. Alleluia. 
This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it and be glad. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Saviour announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Saint John, who proclaimed life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The Lord Jesus says, Whoever receives my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And whoever loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will reveal myself to him. And Judas, not the Iscariot, said to him, Master, Then how shall this come to pass that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered and he said to him, Whoever loves me shall keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him, and we will make our dwelling within him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And yet the word that you hear is not mine, but that of the Father who sent me. I have told you this while I am yet with you. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit that the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you everything, and he will remind you of all that I have told you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. This is the truth, peace be with you. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So we live in a culture that forms consumers, buy things, use things, store things, buy even more storage to store more things. And all of this aspect by making us consumers does not make us creators. We actually don't produce very much when we think about it. When's the latest craftsman that you've met who can actually cobble shoes or shoe a horse or even who's the last farmer you've known who could actually feed a village because of their knowledge that they have of agriculture? 
We don't create much. And it creates a great amount of instability and fear. If the power went off this week, what do you do? There's no fridge, no grocery store. What do we do? What do we produce? We live in a world by consumption. And the consumption also leads to other things that are compounded by social media. Because when you think of social media, you can always just swipe right or left and make your decisions and always wait perhaps the next one as I keep scrolling will be better choice. And so we don't, we, we come to a culture now that can't make commitments either. So now we have an entire generation and two that can't be married, don't get married. They want sex, they shack up, but to be married, to commit to life, to form a family, to create another generation of the servants of God, of human beings, it's hard. It's not because we're malicious, it's not because we're evil. But by the modern world, we are made superficial, that's for sure. But it also makes us discontented. And it means that we shop around all the time. And we shop around looking for something that measures up to what I want. And inevitably, I can't find something that I want in all of its details. And as a result, I'm always discontented and I keep moving around and moving around and moving around, whether it's virtually on a computer or whether it's physically. We move from community to community, we move around, we shop around, we shop around for our churches. We keep doing all these things because we're always looking for something that fits me. Well, if I'm only looking for something that fits me, it's inevitable that I'm never going to be satisfied. Whereas what our Lord says is that it is a new creation to make us not only receive his grace, but also to create things where we are, to deal with the situations of what God's providence and the plan of salvation gives to me. I remember meeting people over the years of my priesthood who would move across the entire continent to be able to be in this parish or that parish. And I would talk to them on the phone because often I was in the parish that was receiving them and it's like, this is great. But are you going to go to mass every day? They were in a place that they really weren't proximate to the church to go to mass every day. So by being here, they were going to live closer. They were going to put their children in the schools. But then I would always ask them the question, where did you come up with this revival of your faith. In one instance, it's like Georgia, the city, the city of, the city of Atlanta. All right. And I would say to them, but if God revived your faith, and now you're quite zealous, which is, you know, thanks be to God, God is operating in Atlanta. He brought you to that revival of your faith. Why do you think you have to go someplace else to live that reality? And then they're usually like this befuddled silence. They wouldn't know what to actually say. And the reason why I would ask this question is because I had other people who had already moved like this across the country and who in arriving became disillusioned because of what they were trying to find. And I would even say on the phone, in the days when that's all you had was the phone, right? And I would say to them, original sin exists here too. And they would come and they had an expectation of something that was supposed to exist and they were disillusioned by their fellow Catholics who are, after all, sinners. And some of these people became completely apostate. They just left the whole religion, stayed in the area, but had just completely upended their following of the gospel. This is tragic. And where does this come from? It's not because these people were bad or evil but they were under illusion. Grace comes into our lives to, set, to, to dissipate illusion. So if you look at the gospel that you have in the bulletin today, there are four things that are taking place here in the structure. Our Lord, when he speaks, this is the beginning of the Last Supper. It's chapter 14, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. These are the texts that we're reading continually. Last week, all during the week, the week before that, all during the week. And so we're given to it on a Sunday that if you look and see what our Lord is saying, these texts are to shatter our preconceptions. And what he's saying is that to understand that 
there are four things in, in this, this section that we have read today. There is illumination, there is response, there is indwelling, and there is peace. That's why I began the sermon with the very last line. Do not let your hearts be troubled, nor be afraid. If we are anything as a culture is, we are afraid. And the last three years, the four years of all of this, it showed that, the absolute terror. Mention I go into the grocery stores in the very beginning of this whole thing, and I would purposely try to make eye contact with people in the aisleways of a grocery store to let them know we're not all dying. And inevitably, some terrified woman will be scurrying by me with her head down on the ground. She's masked. I'm masked. It's not like I'm walking around breathing on you. Just trying to make some kind of contact to break the illusion of the terror that we live in. When grace enters into the world, it is to begin to shatter that darkness of original sin and of our own personal sins. That's what grace comes into our lives to do. It comes in, first of all, to give us vision, to allow us to see. And when we see, it's almost miraculous, because then all of a sudden we can see the things that can happen here, not across the country, not down the street, not on the other side of the state, but here. Because now I am no longer in that illusion, but by the grace that is given, that's why we call faith an illumination. It illuminates the spirit. But our Lord requires a response because we're free beings. And so we have to, we're supposed to respond to this. And when we respond, because this is the answer to St. Jude, right? Because our Lord says, I will be gone from you. And St. Jude asks this question, how is it that you, we will see you, but the world won't see you? This is all this gospel is today, at the very beginning of the Last Supper. Our Lord says, he gives us how we are seen by that we see our Lord, but that our Lord is not seen by the world. And the key is in the response. How do we respond to grace when it comes to us? Do we actually receive the grace, or do we just simply go on to find something else? When we think about our religion and the practice of our religion as we term it these days, most people think of religion as something that originates in me. And I make choices, and I do things, and I do novenas, and I say the rosary, and I go to mass, and I do these different things. But they see it as originating in them, which is why then we immediately fall under the illusion that I'm a really good person, because I do pious things. So our Lord begins shattering here immediately by saying, the one who actually loves me is the one who keeps my word. You'll know if you actually love me because you're following the gospel. That's all he says. But it's coming from me. It's my word. It's my teaching. And those who keep my words, who hear, who receive my words, and who practice them, who observe them, who keep them, this is the one who loves me. And then he tells St. Jude, and my father will love this individual. So it's a reciprocity. We give the grace, grace is responded to, and then he says, and my father will love, and we will come to this individual, and we will dwell within him. So last week on the Feast of the Holy Trinity, we talked about the idea of God's presence within us, which transforms the spirit, opens it up, and moves us to a disposition before God. This is what we call the divine indwelling. This is what makes us creative. This is what makes us understand in the divine plan of redemption. We're meant to be doing something here, not swiping left and right and trying to find something else somewhere, but by receiving where we are at in our own lives and making this thing beautiful. It's a very small idea verbally, but it's transformative of family life, it's transformative of marriage, it's transformative of education, it's transformative of everything if we actually understand this. And as I've often quoted of St. John of the Cross, he says that there where you find no love, put love, and you will discover love. Now again, word for word, that's a very easy thing to say. But what is St. John of the Cross saying in the 16th century? We are always disappointed 
with things around us, inevitably. And people are always disappointed with us because we're all frail and we're all weak. And it's the reason why Hollywood movies and the horror of I have to find my soulmate and this is the one with a capital O is all absurd. It is a question of collaborating with one another who are wounded and broken in many ways to become better than we are in a partnership transformed by grace. It's a very simple idea, again, verbally. But the indwelling is this is why those individuals see the Lord Christ and the world just keeps bumbling along shopping or hiking or whatever else they're doing right now. Because the world doesn't see, they don't have vision. And if they don't see, they just live in that illusion and living in the illusion, they're always under fear. And then quite susceptible just to be the consumer the way we're formed culturally these days. And then because they were a consumer, we actually aren't creative in any way. We actually don't transform anything. We certainly don't put love in a place where we don't find love. We just gripe against the people who don't love. And our Lord is saying this is not the way it works. This is a continuation in a certain sense of, because we have nonstop reading of this Last Supper, I keep coming back to the idea of the question of the power in the pagan world. In the world of darkness, what is principle and foundational to everything is power. It's control. We can put you in prison. We can come after you in the IRS. We can do all kinds of things to you. And that's how you keep the population placid. But it means also culturally we just live in fear. Not terror. We aren't screaming and running through the streets. But all you had to do is have nude broadcast and watch the entire population go into terror. It's showing you something that is under the surface. This is not what God wants. This is not what God created. He did not make us to be terrified individuals who live in illusion and who are always looking for something else somewhere until the day they die. Always discontented, always looking for something else. Oh, if I just made this much more money, my life would be different. If I had a different job, it would be different. If I had married a different person, it would be different. If I had different children, it would be different. If I had different parents, it would be different. All of these things, it's just somewhere else, there's something someplace. And it, it takes us away from the understanding of the plan of salvation, which is this ability to see. So it's illumination, response to grace, the response of God to the indwelling of the Holy Trinity within the individual, and then peace. So when you see the structure of what our Lord is saying, it's why he goes step by step in this, to explain this transformation. And if you understand it, this is the very foundation of the whole mystical life of being a Catholic, are in these, whatever, 10 lines or whatever, six lines that are here. And when this actually enters into our minds, it transforms the world. St. Ignatius of Antioch, all right? So he's bishop of Antioch, and he's martyred around the year 107. Right? So this is the very beginning of the church. The Christians always looked upon the pagan world as being this thing of power that ultimately behind it is demonic. The Christians didn't look around and say, oh, Jupiter and Athena and Venus, these are all fake, they're nothing, right? As if Christianity were some kind of like rationalist program of saying, why are you doing this, it's just superstitious. No, the Christians saw Athena and Jupiter and the rest of them as being demons, controlling people in the world under darkness and in fear. That's why you make sacrifices, because you need something. You want to avoid something. And so the Christians saw this from the very beginning, always saw a demonic influence in them because it's power. And it, because of that aspect, what they do with the idea of an illumination response indwelling in this new vision is you set, you set yourselves to creating an entire, ultimately entire new parallel culture. And St. Ignatius of Antioch in 107, doubtless there are not a lot of Christians at this time, proportionate to the number of pagans in the Roman Empire. But as a result, what's taking place is Ignatius already articulates very clearly the vision of Christianity in those first decades. So as he's being taken to Rome from Antioch, he writes a series of letters to people and to the churches in the area along the way to Ephesus, he writes to, he writes to Polycarp, 
the bishop of Smyrna. And as he's writing these, he's on his way to death, but this man is creating. This man is with a vision seeing the positive things that can be done and transformed under the hand of God. If we had only that initial vision of that type of a thing, we would be also as creative and as effective as St. Ignatius of Antioch. But when he writes about it, where is this vision taking place? It is manifested within the mysteries, within the sacraments, and we receive within our prayer lives. And as a result, what takes place when St. Ignatius is writing to the Ephesians, he says, this is the beginning and the end of life. This is the very beginning and the purpose of life. Faith is the beginning and love is the end. The purpose why we are created is charity. What illuminates the beginning of our lives? Faith. And he says the two together in unity are of God and all other things that lead to the nobility of character follow from them. So the whole vision is about faith and about charity, not in a sentimentalistic manner, but in a way which is transformative to bring about. Now he's writing this, he's going to be dead in a few weeks time, but he never lets go of the vision. Right now in the morning office, we're reading the first epistle of St. John, which I encourage you to read the same author of today's gospel. But St. John insists again and again, this world that we live in is passing. It's ephemeral. The very term ephemeral in our English language comes from Greek. Ephemera in Greek means a day. When we say something's ephemeral, it means it passes. It's just maybe a day long. And St. John comes back continually to the fact of the world that we live in is passing. So why do you live in terror of it? Why to live in fear of these things, but to see the transformative aspect of God's grace working from the inside out. And we are meant to be vehicles of that grace. And so when we speak about the temporal world as passing, it is the vision of faith that allows us to see that and to dissipate the illusion. And so when you read this gospel again, and to understand that the world is ephemeral, this is why the world does not see Christ but why some in the world see Christ. I know this is intense. I looked at this gospel today, and I thought, what am I gonna actually talk about this? You read it, the words are very clear. But to understand what our Lord is saying in the hours before his, his arrest, his betrayal, his arrest, his passion, and his death is not obvious. But when you go into actually the very depth, this is the very essence of what the plan of salvation is. So that when St. Ignatius writes again, again in the letter to the Ephesians, he says, how do you shatter this illusion? Not by moving across the country, not by going anywhere, but by being where you are and receiving grace and being transformed. And that the Lord Jesus manifests himself in the mysteries. So you're very wise to be in these pews and not at camp. I mean, you may be at camp this afternoon, but because it's in the mysteries that the Lord Jesus manifests. And so St. Ignatius of Antioch, when he's writing, he says, for as frequently as you come together as a congregation, celebrate the Eucharist, as often as you come together as a congregation, the powers of Satan are destroyed. Now, you have to really think about this phrase for a while, that by the very fact of the mysteries, by coming together in them, not because of us, but because we are called together within the body of Christ, that we come then to this stabilization, that we come to this dissipation of illusion, and therefore we come to a stabilization, and then we come to the question of the order within our lives, which is why he says we find peace, which is why the end of the gospel today he says, peace I give to you. But it doesn't mean you're happy with a big bag of chips and a two liter bottle of soda and watching Netflix. That's not peace. That's a sensual contentedness for a moment, I suppose. And then you always feel sick because you eat too many chips after anyway. So, so it's a moment and it's passing. That's why our Lord immediately says, but not as the world gives do I give you. This is a transformation in vision. So if we are able to do this, we will find lives of much greater stability and much greater peace personally, individually, 
And because of that greater stability, we will help as a vehicle of grace, help transform and bring security to others around us. Then we become the peacemakers that our Lord talks about in the Beatitude. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. That's what that means, that they become in their place. And then they are the ones who understand St. John of the Cross. Where you do not find love, put love, and there you will find love. May God grant us this peace, the shattering of our illusions, and most importantly, perhaps in this modern world, giving us a sense of stability and rootedness that we flourish where we're at, bring grace into this world, and find the peace of Christ that nothing else can give us except his grace and our free response to it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Almighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now receive these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his, and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Bartholomew. Be mindful, O God, of the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Be mindful also of all those who share with us today in this offering. Continue with the anaphora of St. John the Apostle on page 815, 815. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God and Father, you are true love, security that is ever sure, and hope that never fails. Grant love, happiness, and everlasting peace to your children here before you. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and souls, and with a holy kiss worthy of your blessed name, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give a greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God. Peace. Love and faith, brothers and sisters, from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And may the God of peace be with us. O Lord, as we bow before your majesty, send us your grace and glorious blessings from the heights of your heavenly sanctuary, that we may glorify you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, you sent your beloved Son at the appointed time for our salvation, and he gave us these holy and life-giving mysteries. Do not look upon us as strangers, and do not turn your holy face away from us because of our many sins. For you alone are the Holy One with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, 
now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. It is right and just. It is right and just to praise you, O Lord of all of heaven and on earth. The powers on high in the heavens where they dwell glorify you. The fiery ranks exalt you, the cherubim bless you, and the seraphim worship you. They cry out and they proclaim.
Rather treat us according to your promises. Forgive our sins, pardon us, and have mercy upon your inheritance. For this your repentant church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, sinful children receive your graces we thank you for them and because of them sacrifice all the holy churches and the shepherds of the true faith, especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, Rashada Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops. With them, we remember the priests, the deacons, and all who serve your church. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace and stability of the whole world, for a blessed and prosperous year, for an abundant harvest, for the sick and the oppressed, for all who call upon your holy name on land, at sea, or in the air, and who profess that you are the true God, we pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, those who have presented the offering upon this altar, those who desired to do so but were unable, and grant them their petitions. We pray to you, O Lord. We remember all the saints, the fathers, prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, Mary, the mother of God, St. Joseph, St. Jude, and St. Bartholomew, and all the righteous and the just. Through their prayers, make us worthy to stand among them. We pray to you, O Lord. <clears throat> Lord, have mercy. Be mindful, O Lord, in your grace of those who have left us and have gone to you from the first Christian disciples to this day. They were signed with the seal of baptism and received the precious body and blood of your Son. They waned for you in your life-giving hope. Raise them up on the last day and in your mercy forgive all their sins. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. 
but the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. O Lord, you are the pleasing oblation who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest who offered yourself as the Lamb. Through your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you. To you be glory forever. God the Father, you accept prayers and you answer petitions. <clears throat> you taught us through your beloved Son to stand before you and to call upon you with pure souls and with clear consciences praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are thine, now and forever. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation and from harm of evil, for you have power over all, and we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. Shlomo el-Kulchun. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of it, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, in your grace and abundant mercy, bless those who bow before you. Make us worthy to share in your life-giving mysteries and to join the assembly of your saints, that with them, we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One, one Holy Father, Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, <coughs> blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth, to him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins, and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, O compassionate and merciful one. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Gracious God and Father, how can we repay you for your goodness and for the salvation you have just given us, who can give you the glory you truly deserve? In our weakness and insofar as we are able, we worship, praise, and thank you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. 
Jesus Christ, our God, we worship, <clears throat> thank, and praise you. We implore your goodness and abundant mercy for the salvation of the whole world, for the protection of the living and eternal rest to the departed, for the feeding of the hungry and the support of the needy, for the visiting of the sick and the consolation of the grieving. Through your grace, dwell in them, and by your abundant mercy, give them life. By your cross, bless your people and protect your inheritance. Adoration is due to you, to your Father, and to your holy and life-giving Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. <clears throat> May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Amen.